Hello everybody! Friday, Friday noon again. Today is a very, very special Friday noon. We have an amazing guest. Supposed to be guests, but uh, so far uh, we only have one with us. Uh, we have Mark Okren, the creator of Klingon, with us. And uh, we cross our fingers. I, I think we're having a little bit of technical issues with, uh, with David. Uh, David J. Peterson, the uh, creator of Dothraki. Uh, hopefully he will be with us uh, in, a, in a short moment. But we have Mark with us. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. All right. So uh, it's just an amazing honor to have you, have you both at Langfest this year. And, and it's, it's just incredible. We're, we're just, you know, excitement is through the roof. And it's, uh, it's actually coming up in a... In a few weeks, too. It's, it's very soon. Yeah, it's about wow. a month. Yeah. Just a month away. There's still a lot of things to do. <laughs> but the, the list of speakers are all on, the, on our website, and, uh, and the program is up there. We only have just, you know, little things, to, some tune-ups to do. But all in all, the preparations are going great. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're going to be at a new, new venue, so there's a, there's a lot of unknowns uh, and new fresh things coming up, but uh, yeah. I'm sure every year we do this. Every year where we, we get you know this big pressure at the end, but it's just so much fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, I mean I think we've had uh, we've, we've I mean we've we've been ple very pleasantly surprised every year. I don't think uh, there's any reason why uh, uh, you know the change of venue, which is a very nice uh, venue, you know, allowing people to see another side of the city. Uh, you know, uh, on 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 the side of the mountain, I think I think it's gonna I think it's gonna be great again. <laughs> so so Mark, if I if I understand this, uh, this is your first time in one of these uh, uh, polyglot sort of multilingual yeah. uh, kind of event. I mean, you must be going to all sorts of language related events. Uh, well, mostly science fiction related events, language related okay, events okay. At, at at universities and things like that. Yeah. Okay, okay. But uh, so, but but it is your first time at, at one of these, you know. But uh, I don't know if you know about Polyglot Conference or Polyglot Gathering, which happens mostly yeah, it's, in it's Europe. Yeah, it's the first one. I wouldn't say it's the first event I've gone to where there's lots of polyglots. Okay, it's okay. the first okay. event I've gone to where sort of that's the point or or, or a feature oh, okay. of it. Yeah. But were you aware of the, uh, the that, that these events uh, were were happening? That this this was a thing, uh, you know, because it's it's, it's still very no. recent. It's fairly recent, so some yes. people don't. Uh, yes, okay, okay. So it's, it's. No, I didn't know about it at all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because about ten years ago, uh, all all of these language events didn't exist. Uh, you know, and quite a lot of events. It's still a fairly new phenomenon. It's getting yeah. more and more known. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. I found out about it when whoever it was contacted me and told okay. me about this. Okay, great. Well, we we know that David uh, had gone to the had presented at the uh, Polygon conference. Uh, which is really the, the, the first one that started the, this movement. And they're a Europe-based uh, event, but they, uh, they, they, were, they presented in New York City in 2015, and I believe that's when David uh -huh. uh, was there. But uh, otherwise, you know, we, we sort of just sprouted off that and, and piggybacked <clears throat> on, on, on this movement and, and got a lot of help also and inspiration from the guys who started off the Polygon conference. So, uh, so this is a, a fun wave. And uh, we try to not say too much, uh, you know, insist on the polyglottism, you know, polyglottery part or the multilingual. We, we try to be more language, try to cater to... I was going to say, again, mm -hmm. from what I can figure out, the, the focus is more on the glot than the poly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah, where, yeah, that's I mean, where we started. Yeah, that's, well, that's sort of the root, uh, yeah. you know, but uh, we, 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 we've really diversified uh, in the past yeah. uh, two, two, three events. Uh, to to try to really be able to be accessible to to everyday yeah. language learners and langu everyday language lovers, right. and right. even e everyday constructed language lovers, <laughs> which is really what, yeah. what we're about today. So, how about you tell us a little bit about your your involvement in in languages and linguistics and and eventually constructed languages? How did all this come about? All uh, this came about by accident, like everything else in life. <laughs> uh, no, I, my undergraduate studies were in linguistics, uh, and graduate studies likewise were in linguistics, focusing primarily on uh, American Indian languages, yes, mostly on the West Coast. 
and oh. mostly in California. Oh, oh look who's here. <laughs> we have uh, a new guest. Bonjour. Hello. Good morning. Hey there. How's it going? <laughs> Hi, David. Good to have you. <laughs> you are dressed. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It's really bright here, wherever this is. How's it going? Good, oh, good. Yourself? Doing great, yeah. Just started. We just uh, just talking a little bit about uh, uh, Mark's uh, adventure uh, into uh, language and construction, constructed languages and how it started. So uh, just catching us right at the beginning. All right. Well, hey, Mark, how's it going, man? Well, so it seems to be a little bit of technical difficulty on Mark's side. Well, okay. I think Mark uh, Hope he goes back. <laughs> we lost Hope Mark. I think you, <laughs> you bumped him off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, he was uh, he was frozen for a couple of uh, seconds there. So uh, I think uh, I think if he just clicks on the link again, uh, he will get back into the. Hopefully, uh, let, the... Let, let, let me just make oh. sure you got carry on, carry on. <laughs> So anyway, I guess we could uh, ask you the same question. We were, uh, oh, okay, he's back. So no, he's going to say uh, his story. <laughs> be back. Yeah. Uh, oh, well. Come on, Mark. We don't have, yeah, we, we, we don't have a, a long time. I uh, hope we could, hope he comes back in. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, no. Yeah. We were just uh, you were just trying to tell us about uh, how he got into uh, linguistics, but I guess uh, we we were going to ask you the same questions. How how did this uh, uh, adventure start? Was this something that that did, that that you had uh, decided that that you had planned before, or did did it come about randomly? Uh, yeah, I guess pretty randomly. Um, <laughs> I went to college. Um, with the intention of being an English major, okay. With the ultimate intention intention of teaching English at high school, um, and also writing fiction, that was my goal. Uh, I added. Um, I, I started learning languages. That was the first thing. Um, I started learning languages in college because I thought it was uh, really fun, and I and I wanted to do it. Uh, so I started learning as many as I could. Um, as many as you could, which yeah, which ones? Uh, um, the first one that I did was uh, Arabic, um, oh. and then um, that was my first semester. Cause I, I didn't want to load up too much. I took two English classes, a class on Arabic and a class on the Doors, uh, the band. Um, and then that was it. <laughs> but then my second semester, I, I, I found that it, it went all right. So I, um, I took another semester of Arabic, and then I took Russian, and then I took wow, Esperanto, yeah. and then I also took English, English courses um, at the same time. And uh, that went pretty well. I think that I, I might have done that. I might have kept up with that um, had I not found linguistics. Oh, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> back the man is back all right I, I, I think it was my intrepid internet provider oh okay <laughs> right on it's it's Maybe a lot more answer your question <laughs> we will come back <laughs> afterwards we're trying to trying to get get to to sort of the the, the, the beginnings of of both you guys because we want to of course get to the the, the, the meat and potatoes of, of why are you guys doing constructed languages and, and how you got into these big projects and, and whatnot. So, but we, we are limited on time. So, so we don't want to, uh, go yeah. Yeah. I've got bad news for you, man. <laughs> uh oh, I think, I think Mark is, uh -oh. yeah, he's frozen again. Oh, not good. Okay. Not good. All right. Oh, but bad news. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of news? <laughs> no, no. I uh, the bad news was that Mark was frozen again. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, see, okay, okay. 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 Oof, I thought that. Okay. Are you back again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's, I'll, I'll just drop in and out. I think. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you know, it, it did stay on for about uh, 15 minutes at the beginning. So let's uh, let's hope uh, it stays that way. Uh, we only need 15 minutes to go to the end. <laughs> That's right. So so you guys studied languages. At, uh, at the university, 
uh, well, David was saying he studied Arabic and uh, and Russian. I mean, you didn't give yourself a, a smooth start there with with those languages. Uh, what about you, uh, Mark? Well, I said, as I was, I was saying, I was studying mostly American Indian mm -hmm. languages. Yep. Uh, and, and mostly ones that had zero speakers, so you didn't have conversations with anybody. Uh, but but that must have started with you know some some passion for this. For, for what's the trigger for studying American, the Native American well, languages? I got interested in linguistics at all by okay, all by, right. by chance. We had a class where I went where I went to school, undergraduate school, that was sort of an introduction to everything. <laughs> Uh, the name of the class was Language, Society, and Culture, Language, Culture, and Society, or something like that, which if you think about it for a second, nothing is excluded from mm -hmm. that, <laughs> uh, in, you know, including physics. So what it turned out to be was an introduction to the various disciplines. Each week, it was a different uh, lecturer. One week was a historian, one week with a philosopher, one week was a literature person, and so on. Uh, language was a, a theme running through it, but from all these different perspectives. And the, the, the bread of the sandwich, so to speak, the beginning and the end was the linguist. And when he talked about language, I'd never heard it talked about in that way before. Uh, or, or I, you know, I, I, in school, I studied Spanish and things like this. But this is a whole different approach. It was really intriguing. I says, oh, I might look into this. So I took linguistics one or whatever it was called. And that was good. So I took linguistics two and that was good. Then summer came. And when I came back from the summer, They'd already revamped the entire program. The school where I went was only one year old when I got there. So now it's two years old. So they decided to remodel everything. Wow. Um, and part of the remodeling in, uh, was taking what was, I'm making these numbers up, of course, was what was linguistics two and linguistics three was now combined into one course. I'd already taken half of it. So they didn't want me to take it again. So they set up uh, an independent study. It was just me and the professor and nobody else, and this is as a, as a sophomore, which is unusual, doing a one-on-one -on -one study about, about language change and historical linguistics is what the part uh, that, I, that I would have taken had they left it alone. And as sort of a, a project to work on, instead of just doing textbook stuff, he gave me a bunch of data from some uh, California Indian languages. Uh, and I, I went to school in California, so it was all very local. Um, and that's what I worked on as sort of a, as, a, as a term project. And then I was hooked. I was hooked on, on this particular language group. I was looked, hooked on studying language in this particular way and went on from there. Wait a minute. You went to Santa Cruz when it started? Well, there was, I was there the second year it existed. It was there one year before me. And we had a choice when you enrolled of going to, uh, there was, it, it, it was built then sort of on the Oxford Cambridge system. There was a whole bunch of colleges. It was yeah. a plan. Uh, and you had to choose one. And when I went, I had a choice of two, the one that was there before and the one that was just opening up. So I chose the one that was just opening up because I didn't want to go to that fuddy old school. <laughs> I wanted to go to the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's wild. You know, when <laughs> I was at, uh, when I was at Berkeley, UC Merced opened up and they, uh, it was in my junior year and they, and they were kind of petitioning for students like an expansion draft. And uh, they, they offered you all of these, you know, really cool, like, you know, bonuses if you wanted to transfer uh, and be like one of the first ever students at UC Merced. But of course, you know, most of us been there a while, so didn't want to change. But I always right. wondered what that would be like to go to a brand new school. It's so cool. What, well, what it was like is nobody knew how to do anything. Because no one had <laughs> ever done it before. <laughs> Oh man! Well, that's good. That's I mean, well. you you get to influence a lot of that, you know, the the, the development process of the whole whole department. Right. And and because it was new, not so much because it was new, but because it was small. Uh, but, well, here's by comparison. I, I gave a talk. That, this is I went to University of California in Santa Cruz for undergraduate. Um, last month or two months ago, I gave a talk there about Klingon and things. Um, and it was a talk for a linguistics class, class and linguistics department about constructed languages. That's what the class was. The enrollment in this class is an online class, which means the students don't have to go anywhere. They could sit at home and hope their internet working <laughs> and watch the <laughs> class. Um, the enrollment in the class is about 600 students, okay? 
when I was an undergraduate there, the enrollment in the entire place, the entire campus was about 600 students. So it was a very different, <laughs> very different thing. <laughs> nice. Awesome. And, because it, and because it was small, uh, when I decided to be a linguistics major, there was no such thing as linguistics as a major at the time. Oh, no. So the computer thinks wow. my major is my major is interdisciplinary studies or something <laughs> like that. Okay. Um, but it was linguistics. So they, they concocted okay. a major, right? They, they cobbled together some kind of a major for me and a couple other people. And this one of the requirements. Uh, Ukraine major. <laughs> right, right. Uh, one, one of the requirements was. Uh, uh oh. oh. <laughs> Mid, oh no. Mid word. Oh, that's rough. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, well, we're gonna have to uh, fast forward a little bit uh, as we we're gonna get that counter that, that countdown thing coming coming up. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about your 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 big project, the, the Game of Thrones with the Dothraki and the High Valerian. How did that come about? Um, Oh, okay, oh yeah, you're, yeah. you are there. Okay, so you you, no. you were frozen too. <laughs> no, that just, would be bad news. I'm just tired, man. I wish I, I wish Mark was still active though, because I want him to talk before I talk, because oh. green is a lot less bright, and uh, <laughs> so when his is the image that I'm looking at, the light is softer on my face, and I look better. I mean, you're, <laughs> You're second best, Nicholas. So this is okay, well, mine's, yes. mine's too bright. Let me, let, me see if I could, let, me, let me see if I could do something. This this thing on my desk. <laughs> no, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, um, what the hell am I? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I we skipped the part where I started creating languages, which was in two thousand. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and so you know, I created languages for like ten years. Um, and then um, there was an opportunity to create, you know, the Dothraki language for Game of Thrones that came to the Language Creation Society. Oh. Um, ultimately, HBO had a contract with the Language Creation Society, uh -huh. and it was on them to subcontract that contract to somebody else. Um, and they could find that person via whatever means they, they chose. And so they chose to set up a contest. Um, and so, uh, you know, many people um, applied, right? Um, there, were, there were lots of language creators all over the internet who found out about the contest. Some didn't, um, some didn't think that it was, you know, a real thing. Uh, so there were a lot of good conlangers who didn't apply, but there were, there were many who did, uh, many conlangers, some, many of whom at least those who follow conlanging have heard of. Um, and then, you know, after, so it was a big competition. It lasted about a month and a half. And uh, there were two rounds. The first round was judged by other language creators. And the second round was judged by the producers themselves. And so after two rounds, I was the one that had won. Uh, and so I went on to, you know, uh, be the language creator on the show. Nice. Um, during that competition, basically, the I mean, the competition was to create. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh, uh, the competition iPhone. was okay. to change create. the device. I think. Okay, good yeah. idea. But it doesn't work. Just change the device. Yeah, it's. Uh... Hey, hey, Mark, Mark, do it landscape. Do it landscape. Wait, can you hear? It? Are we here, can you Mark? Hear Mark? I'm, I'm on my phone now. Does this yeah. work? Yeah. Yeah, it does work. It Perfectly. Does work. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, David was just telling us about uh, how he uh, came to be the uh, creator of the Game of Thrones uh, languages. Uh, and uh, while you, you were saying it, I mean, you said that 10 years prior to, uh, you know, applying uh, for, you know, to, to be uh, that, that person, uh, with uh with game of thrones you had 10 years of experience creating languages was that a hobby was that and what did you did you create languages for uh your stories or just uh, just for yourself for your own uh your, your own enjoyment what, what, what was it for yeah yeah it was just for myself for my own enjoyment um that's what all of us kind of did it for uh because you know there weren't you know there weren't opportunities to do anything else 
uh, but, you know, I was a part of a, a pretty large community of language creators at the time. And, um, yeah, that's what we all did. We just, uh, created languages just for fun. Um, and so I, I never really had, uh, I never really had any like, you know, stories that they went with or anything like that. I was just okay. creating the languages just by themselves, just for fun. Um, you know, many, many people did, many people continue to do that. Uh, and so, you know, little by little, I, I just got better and better at it. Cool. And, and so, Mark, did you, uh, so you missed some of uh, uh, David's uh, story, but uh, so you yeah. told us about uh, yeah. about your, your, your academic background and how you got one of the first uh, linguistics degrees uh, right. at your college. Uh, but did you uh, already have an interest uh, or in, in language creation? Is that something that you were not in language, not, not in language creation? No, I, I didn't. I didn't know that was a thing, really. I mean, I've heard of it, but didn't really know much about it. Ironically, looking back now, it, it's ironic. Uh, in, in that class I was telling you about with the linguistics professor was the beginning and the end of it. Uh, at some point during all of that, he mentioned something about hobbits and this guy called Tolkien and this <laughs> elvish thing. And I had no idea what he was talking about at the time. Uh, so after class, I went up to him and I said, go, what was that? You know, so he gave me some more information. He said, oh, go read this book or these series of books and so on and so forth. The reason that's interesting is because that was the very first time I talked to this guy who turned out to be my main professor, you know, my main inspiration you know, to get into linguistics and all that stuff. So the initial conversation I ever had with him about linguistics was about a constructed language, uh, having wow. no idea that that's what I would end up doing, you know. Uh, That's so cool. And uh, and so, how did it come about that uh, that you came to create Klingon? Did you have prior contact with Star Trek? If I'm not mistaken, so that the, the real the creation of the Klingon language was uh, was was something that came about for the first movie in '79, right? Right. So it right. didn't come. It, it it didn't start. You know, with the uh, the original series. So uh, how did you get in touch with them? Well, they got in touch with me. I, uh, they got in touch with you. <laughs> the, the, the reason, the reason they, they called me to do Klingon is because a couple of years, this was Star Trek III, uh, was because a couple of years before that, I did Vulcan for Star Trek II. So I was oh. sort of their, their language guy, I guess. Although what I did for Vulcan, I wouldn't call conlanging. It was, it was dialogue creation or special effects or something like that. But because I did that, uh, they thought of me when they decided they wanted to have a language for Star Trek three. I don't even know if they knew there was one, frankly, <laughs> in the motion picture because it was a different uh, crew putting the movie together. I knew it. Mm. So I went back to the first movie and looked at that. There was maybe six lines and said, okay, that's, that's real Klingon. I don't know how the grammar works or what word means okay. what or what syllable goes together, but that's the beginning. So you weren't involved in, um, in in the first movie, you just based uh, your language on whatever material already ex already existed for the yeah, first movie. Yeah, and as I say, yeah, it was only about about six six or seven lines. Uh, there was only one word that was clearly repeated, which is the word means fire the torpedo, which is <laughs> ah, one word, one syllable word. Uh, so you know, I so I wrote down the words. I didn't know what, what a word was. If it was two syllables, I didn't know if it was one word or two. So I just kind of imposed a structure on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and wrote down all the sounds and then expanded and expanded and expanded. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so have you been involved in every installment of, uh, of the franchise, be it movie or uh, series where it appears? Because even in, in the latest series in, in Discovery, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Klingon being spoken. Uh, the Klingon have you been involved uh, uh, to this? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the short answer is no, I haven't been involved in all of them. Uh, I was involved in all the, all the movies uh, was Klingon is spoken with the original cast, not with the original character. Well, the original cast and original characters too. Uh, all of those movies. Uh, some of the TV shows, Next Generation, Deep Space yeah. Nine, but not all of them. Um, for Discovery, I was not involved for Klingon at all. Uh, I know who was. Uh, so a woman who lives, uh, uh, um, Robin Stewart, she lives in Vancouver. 
um, oh. and she she did it. Uh, the language is what I came up with. I mean, all the words, all the grammar and stuff is what I came up with, but she actually translated the dialogue uh, mm. for the actors. Great. Great. So, uh, David, on your side, uh, uh, what was your involvement uh, with the, the Game of Thrones uh, crew like? Uh, was it very hands-on or did they ask you to just uh, uh, create uh, a couple of languages uh, and then you just handed them, uh, you know, grammar and dictionary, and let them, uh, you know, just uh, do their thing with, uh, with with what you've done. How, how did it work? I did all the translation. I just never met with anybody, or never went to the set, or anything like that. I kind oh, of uh, you, you never you never worked with the actors uh, directly. No. Oh wow. No, you know, that's their choice. Uh, I've worked on a bunch of different things, and you know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Because I watched it's the video bitter. you you uh, that that you were talking about, you know, how you derive some of these, you know, the syntax and whatnot. And I remember you talking about Japanese, and 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 I assume a lot of these things with pronunciations are are quite difficult um, for an uh, you know a layman, I guess, to to try to figure out uh, out of nowhere. I mean, you well, build I mean, in just, specific pronunciations, right? I mean, I describe them, but also, okay. uh, you know, they have the audio. So you just ah, listen to it and I do see. it. Now, okay. if you if you can't do a trill, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you can't do a trill. I haven't had a lot of luck uh, describing how to do alveolar trills to anybody. But everything else, um, like every other sound, there's there's a way to do it. There's a way to approximate it. It's it's not too tough. Um, I, I I found that it, it works all right, but um, yeah, I mean you know I mean definitely the results are better if I get to work with the actors. And so you know sometimes I do, uh, sometimes I don't. It just depends on depends on really the producers and what they want and the actors and and what they ask for. Um, but yeah, yeah. Some sometimes that, that means uh, what ends up on the screen isn't as good. But you know, beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. <laughs> well, uh, I know there's and, probably from the producers' perspective, they some of them may be saying, "I mean, who's going to know the difference?" Uh, and yeah, they do say else? that often, yeah, which I is mean, funny because they do know the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fans always know the difference. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, the more uh, the more tokens there are, the more, li more lines there are, the better and better they get at being able to tell. Um, sometimes, uh, unlike, you know, by, yeah, by the last season of Game of Thrones, I was finding out about the errors that were being made, you know, like minutes after the initial airing. <laughs> okay, the people are very, uh, you know, they have uh, their, their ears open for uh, everything that you throw at them, I guess. And, uh, All right. Uh, let me let me take one one minute here. Uh, it is a live stream, so we do want to acknowledge the folks that are that are watching. Uh, That's true. There's a few questions and, too. And there's a few oh questions God, there are that people are watching this. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a uh, we we do have a few questions. So we, you know we've got uh, we've got Tessa, we've got Chanel, we've got uh, Patrick, June, um, Manuel. Uh, so, anyways. Um, there's a list of people. I wouldn't go down everybody, but uh, let me let me go down to some of these questions uh, and and see what you guys can can provide. So here's one that says, "What would you say to a child who had constructed a language? A child, I guess, a kid, to uh, to some extent, separate from separate from their own, with no goals of doing so." Okay, so what would you say to somebody, I guess, who who who's just purely interested in in creating languages? Uh, with no no goal, I guess you guys were like that, right? You just did it because it was fun. Yeah, that's. Is this something I mean, that's what I did. Is this something to? Yeah, I yeah, was that's what I did. Yeah. It's lots of fun, and so basically, as long as you're enjoying what you're doing, then you're not doing it wrong. If there's uh, some element of it you don't enjoy or you want to improve upon, there's now tons of resources for you to be able to work work with that. Uh, many of them free because they're just online created by other language creators. If, uh, if you're ever looking for resources, a good place to go is the Language Creation Society's website, uh, conlang.org, C-O-N-L-A-N-G 
uh, period org. Um, they have a resources page that will lead you everywhere. It's very good. All right. I mean, I I think I'll branch off a little bit on on that question. Uh, you know, musicians talk about playing for passion and love, and then they've got producers who come in and tell them to do this. You know, that's gonna have a general appeal. Does that happen with you guys? I guess you know the the stuff that you create that's sort of like way out there with this type of grammar from that language and this pronunciation, but then you come to something that's commercial, then you have to like tone it down. Do you feel you have to like tone it down or, or produce it a certain way that you're not particularly a fan of? That only happened to me once and only, and only sort of with, um, the, the, in my experience, they're very concerned with what the thing sounds like. Mm -hmm. what the language sounds like but once they say yeah we kind of like 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 the way that goes then it's free reign nice. I mean, they've never been had any concern about how the grammar works or or anything <laughs> like that there was one exception where i did come up with something and i and i was told no 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 that doesn't sound right at all that doesn't sound like what it's supposed to mean even though of course it meant what it was supposed to mean so <laughs> i had to change that that only happened once and it was not playing on yeah i mean um for for me like there are certain things that I don't do grammatically because uh, specifically because in order to get it right, um, you need to have a lot of information about exactly how something is going to be blocked the day that it's shot. Uh, you know, how many, how many people there are going to be, how many people are going to be talked to, for example. Uh, and so for that reason, I, I tend not to do those things, um, whereas I might otherwise. Like, you know, it's it's sometimes it's hard to tell if you're going to be, if the character is going to be talking to exactly two people versus just several people. Um, and so, you know, I might pull it back and not do a duel for reasons like that. Other than that, just for like the sound of it, I mean, there's always a compromise there because they care about it. Um, so the sound maybe isn't going to be 100% the way you want it to. And you're not working with the full range of sounds that are used in human languages. Um, you're only working with a subset. But I don't know, for the most part, it's fine. Really, honestly, the, the most limiting factor I find is just the setting, um, you know, the, the, the world that you're creating the language for. Because, you know, a lot of times the world building is so-so. Let's put it that way. <laughs> huh. All right. Yeah, well, I, 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 but I think for I think in both uh, the keys that, that we're talking about, uh, be it Game of Thrones uh, or Star Trek, there's a, a pretty uh, a pretty deep uh, world and you know universe uh, behind each one. Uh, so uh, maybe not at the beginning, at least for for Klingon, but now I mean it's. Uh, six series so many movies and uh, you know how many seasons of uh, game of thrones i don't know what was it what is all were all seasons already written uh in the novels uh because i uh, i actually haven't watched it yet i, I hope hopefully I, I will be able to uh in the near future is that the, had the world been uh, been developed actually that ties into a, a question that we have actually uh, from emmanuel who's watching who, who asks uh how much of uh, Dothraki and High Valyrian was already created uh, by George Martin and ex already existed in the bar in the background, if at all? So by the time that the show started uh, filming, there had been four novels written in a seven novel series or a planned seven novel series. Um, now five have been written. Uh, the fifth one came out. Um, I want to say before the third season, I don't exactly remember, but um, in terms of the material that was there, there were um, a little over 50 words of uh, words and names of Dothraki. And there were a couple of full sentences and then uh, a few more uh, phrases, just uh, like two or three word phrases or names. Um, so I made sure to incorporate all of that. Um, that was good. It was, it was consistent. Um, it was, a, it wasn't necessarily extremely out of the ordinary in terms of like, if you talk about like an Indo-European language, especially a Western Indo-European language versus, you know, something radically different, like, uh, like, like in Actitude, 
but um, but it was consistent and so that was good um and then uh, for high valerian there were two phrases and, and then aside from that um two other words maybe three um and then a lot of names and then that was it so you know i made sure to incorporate all that um and then moved on from there yeah wow well speaking of moving on we we do have to move on but we've got folks just you know popping in questions yeah. Uh, uh, should I take one more or should we, I, I, I think we should. Maybe, uh, I mean, I think the last question is, this, uh, is interesting now that this we is, have a little bit more time. Let's just, uh, let's yeah, just take the last point. question that, uh, okay. it, so it, it's it, about interaction with uh, speakers of, uh, of your languages. So the question by uh, John Harness is, what's it like interacting with, uh, <laughs> interacting with the advanced speakers of your languages? <laughs> Do you speak the languages with them? Do they correct your usage ever? Uh, since <laughs> I know Mark works with some, Klan speakers. Some people take it like words, quite far. How do you, how do Dothraki Valian speakers create or receive uh, new words? There was even uh, this guy who, who was raising his baby in, in Klingon, uh, like as a, as a native language. I remember seeing that. So some people really push the, push the envelope on, on, on learning these languages. So did they come up and, and <laughs> correct your grammar or actually speak to you uh, in these languages for extended period of time? Talk about philosophy, politics, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they come up and speak with me a little bit. They speak with each other a lot. <laughs> right. uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and there's, some, there's some, for Klingon, there's some speakers who are absolutely fluent you can you can go on, on on YouTube and see you know videos in Klingon where they it's like regular YouTube things. Oh, let me show you around my house. Oh, I'm going to the store today. Come with me. You know, but it's it's all in Klingon and they're making it up as they're going along. It's not like it's scripted or anything. Uh, so there's people who do that. Uh, I I'm not the world's greatest Klingon speaker. I'll admit that. Uh, there's people who are much 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 better than I am, and sometimes I'm a little bit reluctant to speak it. Uh, uh, around good Klingon speakers anyway, because if I say something and I'm wrong, it suddenly becomes right because I said it and I've messed up everything. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I, but my, my understanding was also that uh, the creator of the language uh, isn't necessarily uh, even fluent in it. Uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's what I've heard. And, you know, it's, it's, you, you, they tend to meet people who uh, actually just are just better at... Uh, at, at using the language than, than, than the creator uh, himself or herself, so. Yeah. That's true in my case. <laughs> yeah. And the people say, why don't, you know, why don't you remember, da, da, da. Partly, you know, <laughs> when, I wrote the, when I wrote the dictionary, I wrote a, a Klingon dictionary, the, the first version of it. Uh, in 1984, 1985, was anybody born then? You know. Um, I was born in 86, and, so and, no. And adding adding <laughs> the words. You know, just because the, the, it was based on on the, the uh, what was what I came up with for Star Trek Three, and there wasn't that much really. I mean, they talked Klingon in it. There's a lot of lines that I made up that didn't end up in the film at all. So there's some stuff there, but not enough to make a reasonably sized book or even a skinny book. Uh, so I added lots and lots of vocabulary. So it's word, 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 word. So I don't remember now what I made up words for. I was just fleshing out the book. You know, I look back and oh, I made up a word for that. Pretty good. Yeah, I um the the process of learning a language is very very different from the process of creating a language. I mean, after you create a word, let's say, I mean, you don't have to remember it. And you don't even have to necessarily use it right away in a sentence. And if you do use it in a sentence, it's not like you necessarily are going to use it in a bunch of sentences. If you think about the way that languages are taught, right? You know, you typically get um, lists of interrelated vocabulary in manageable chunks. And then you go through a bunch of exercises so that you practice using that vocabulary to try to memorize it. I mean, that's just, I mean, nothing like that happens when you're creating a language. So there's not only no incentive to, uh, you know, memorizing the words that you create right away. Uh, there's no built-in um, method for having you do so as well. Uh, and so it's really, really quite different. So it's like, you know, after a few months, you might have, you know, many hundred words, and, you know, might remember just two or three, maybe four uh, ones that, I don't know, 
stuck in your memory for some particular reason, maybe because you like the way it sounded, maybe because you didn't like the way it sounded. But, um, you know, aside from that, unless you're going to sit down and actually go through the process that you would for learning a language, you're not going to be fluent simply by dint of having created it. Um, you, you will probably know the grammar a little bit better than you would the vocabulary, though, because especially if you're doing translation, you have more interaction with the grammar than you do actually than you do with the vocabulary. Um, uh, just because you you have to use it again and again and again, and so it benefits you to memorize it so you don't have to constantly keep looking stuff up. Um, anyway, was that the question? <laughs> no, that, question. That's... Well, I, th I think you, it's, it's sort of uh, yeah. it's sort of in that direction. Uh, I, I got the question was uh, on, on Facebook. The question was how do you or do you actually even interact with people? Uh, who speak your languages uh, and but that bran you branched them, off you to, to use them but that yeah. branched off language. sort of to to whether the the creators are actually fluent in that language per se yeah you know of, but of my languages there's only one fan community um and it's the the fan community for my language tree get a slang um on the hundred um that's really the only language i have that has a like an active you know engaged fan community where people are actually learning and using the language um, and that's that was pretty cool uh, because by the time I was working on that show I'd given up on the idea of my languages having fans because they really didn't uh, at that time um, but uh, but yeah man like the, it's it's really cool like interacting with them I don't uh, I mean, they actually, you know, commit to using the language and learning it. I don't do it as much. Um, and I'm probably not as good at coming up with stuff off the cuff, but, um, but, you know, nevertheless, you know, we chat all the time. We do it on, on Slack. Actually, let me, let me see. Let me see if people are, are doing stuff right now. Ah, they are. <laughs> cool. They're not watching this live right now. Oh, no, because I'm probably, uh, because, you know, you always leave the Tawaki and stuff, and they'll be like, when are you going to talk about Trigger to sign? <laughs> All right. So, so we do want to move a little bit further down uh, the timeline here. We, mm -hmm. you guys are going to be presenting at Langfest on Tothraki and on Klingon, and there's a big surprise event. Well, on um, Friday night, the August 23rd, that even we, the organizers, don't really know what the contents are going to be. Is there a, a little peek, you know, sneak preview that you can give us without giving uh, everything away, or is this? Yeah. Uh... And you and you guys totally, you you guys totally don't know about it because of how awesome and special it's going to be. Not be <laughs> <laughs> great. Like, you like it that way. We haven't done you know enough planning or anything. It's definitely. <laughs> the former <laughs> that's okay well, that's okay you know no, no I, I i i think i, I think it's gonna be good i i trust that uh, you know <laughs> we're going to we're going to and the participants are going to enjoy it yeah yeah well just let, let's put it this way mark and i will be on the stage at the same time one of and us and i won't be on the internet <laughs> that's right yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna freeze on stage are you no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. all right but we are definitely looking forward to this this is it's just an amazing you know, situation we've got both of you it, just having one of you would have been you know a tremendous honor but now having both of you uh, i don't know if, if you guys had been on stage elsewhere together uh and you know under these uh these type of uh you know in these type of events but uh this is this is something really f fresh new way to work uh, and and look at uh, you know collaboration i think yeah it's it's going to be it's going to be really cool because we're going to we're we're, we're going to try to f dig some stuff up uh I, i'll just say that i am in the process of trying to find an, an eight inch floppy drive right now <laughs> i i have feelers out and i have my fingers crossed i'm feeling good about it so and that that will be relevant if i can find it <laughs> and i haven't told you yet david what i found so anyway. oh. 
<laughs> this is like yeah, a, the two a brain, you, uh, brainstorming session going right going on right now. <laughs> had the two of you met uh, in person before? Of course. Yes. Oh yes, yeah. Have. Trust me, if we if we hadn't met in person, I would have showered first. <laughs> <laughs> I will take that as a compliment, I think. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Langfest definitely looks forward to to meeting you guys. We heard from Mark that you've never been to Montreal, so definitely. Neither have be... I. Wow, because oh. I, I know you were at the Polyglot Conference in 2015 with Richard Simcott and and Ellen, uh, and all the the, the nice yeah. polyglots of this world. And I attended, and so the Tetsu and so did Joy, other co-organizers. So, so it will Man. be it will be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to having to uh, dust off my Parisian French and see if <laughs> people are offended by it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So for the folks watching, if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, um, definitely go to langfest.org. The, the dates are, again, August 23rd to 25th. And on the 23rd at night, we will have the Language Creators Night. I mean, that's sort of what we, what we called it. Um, it's yeah. quite it's wide open you are language creators and it's going to be your night but that we have nothing we don't know what the contents are going to be <laughs> but uh, that, that's, it, it, that's going as, to be something as, special as a language creator i think it's safe to say that we will create the content for that evening <laughs> nice yes good good so we don't have to change the title of that of that night and then on saturday uh we'll have david uh close uh, cl close off that day with a dothraki workshop and uh and mark will uh, give us a klingon workshop on sunday just before we uh, we finish the, the whole event so uh look forward to that everybody this is going to be a blast it's going to be another huge year for langfest so uh and it's coming up in a few weeks we are we are yeah. trembling with 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 you know, nerves and 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 pressure, but it's going to be a blast. Definitely, it's going to be fun. Right on. I am looking forward to it. As am I. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, hope you come in a, a few days early, and we'll uh, grab a few drinks before before the big event. Yeah. And show Social you activities around. before the event, as always. So show you around in, in Montreal, and again, brush up your your French. It's a, it's a special French in Quebec. <laughs> okay. Right so thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, look forward to meeting you in Montreal. And you too. Right on. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have Bye -bye. a great weekend. All right. Have a nice day. We're supposed to leave meeting. Okay. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, we are the.